Great. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. What's the difference? <laughs> Not between me and Grant. What's the difference between someone who becomes a believer in Jesus and lasts the course and bears fruit for him and someone who doesn't? What makes the difference in that case? Well, let, let me introduce you to a few friends of mine. Uh, the first one, there's, there's Stan. So Stan has been coming to church for years now. He was invited along by a Christian friend from a shop that they both used to work in. And he went along to Christianity Explored course, and, and he really enjoyed it. And he liked the new friends he made at church, and he has loads of nice things to say about Christians. Uh, but over time, Stan became less bothered about going to church. It just seemed less important. It didn't really seem to make any difference to him. He just didn't really seem to get what everyone else got. That, that's Stan. Second of all, there's Alex. So unlike Stan, Alex had the great privilege of growing up in a Christian home. Uh, she was raised by parents who took their Bibles seriously and taught it to her and took her along to church. And so when Alex finished school, she decided to go to university and study theology. It wasn't long into Alex's course at uni that she realised that no one else in her seminar group read the Bible the same way that she did. Uh, some read it very cynically. Some read it with a, a kind of massive agenda that they were bringing to every single class, it seemed. And some just made the Bible say whatever they wanted it to say. And over time, it almost felt like Alex's new friends were making fun of her for the way that she took the Bible so seriously. And within a year, Alex didn't really know what she believed about the Bible for herself anymore. And then the third, there's Jason. Now, Jason became a Christian in his third year of university. He was studying engineering. And he wasn't really sure why, but during the university holidays, he was, he was on his own in his, in his flat. And he just decided to go along to the local church um, that was just along the road from where he lived. And he made friends with someone there who started reading the Gospel of John one-on-one -on -one with him. And sometime around John 4, um, Jason committed himself to Jesus and became a Christian and joined the church. But a few years later, Jason had made new friends. He, he got into drinking heavily. He made uh, he started dating a non-Christian girlfriend, who kept nagging him to propose to her. And Jason felt like he was at a crossroads with his faith and with his life. Stan, Alex, and Jason. Now, in each case, I've actually squished the stories of two people into kind of um, one person with a made-up name. But all of those experiences are real and not uncommon anyway. So here's the question again. What makes the difference between someone that continues on with Jesus and someone that doesn't? And if you, like me, have seen friends have a whole host of reactions to hearing the gospel as you've tried to share it, what keeps us going at sharing the gospel with our friends? What helps us not give up in our evangelism and our ministry to other people in church that we know? Well, I said earlier, we've started working through Mark's Gospel together in, in these Sunday evenings this term. I divided Mark up into 11 kind of chunks, you could call them, um, most about a chapter and a half each. And so each, each week we'll, we'll look at kind of the next chunk of Mark, and Lord willing we'll finish by Christmas. Um, but each week we're going to focus in on one particular passage that kind of sums up the whole chunk. And we'll, we'll work through Mark that way so we can understand what the kind of structure of the book is. And if you want to read through the book as we go along, that would be a great idea, so you don't miss reading any. Uh, if you read up to the end of Mark chapter 6 for yourself by this time next week, when Grant comes to uh, preach on that for us, then you'll be up to date. So that's one, one chapter a day between now and this. <coughs> anyway, in chapter 1, we saw Jesus appear on the scene and begin to demonstrate his identity and his authority. And so far, it has to be said, he's done that mainly through his spoken word. So chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus went about proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then a couple of different incidents. Jesus goes and calls his disciples to follow him. He rebukes demons with, with words. He forgives sins. Uh, sure, there are times when Jesus heals people in the first few chapters of Mark, but even then it's it's mostly done simply with words, telling people to pick up their mat and walk. Mark is, is showing us the authority of Jesus' voice. Then chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus says to his disciples, kind of summing up what I'm saying, 
A huge crowd following him around trying to listen to him. Verse 38. Let us go on to the next town that I may preach there also. For that is what I came for. So Jesus speaks with great authority. And it seems like everyone wants to hear what he has to say. Then we arrive at chapter 3. Which is where we are this evening. And we find something very surprising. Actually not everyone it seems wants to hear Jesus. In fact the people you most expect to want to hear Jesus and listen to him, the kind of insiders, if you like, they just don't seem to get it. So there's there's a famous quote by a writer called C.S. Lewis. You've probably heard of him about Jesus. It's often called the mad, bad, or God trilemma. This is what Lewis says. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, or you can spit at him and call him a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. If you've read a gospel for yourself, you'll see why Lewis says that. Uh, Some of the things Jesus says about himself are are staggering claims. This wasn't just someone who walked around teaching some nice moral lessons and then died an unfortunate death. In the Gospels, Jesus makes huge claims about himself and demonstrates huge power and authority over others. So if you want to reject Jesus, then you are free to, to call him mad or you're free to call him demonic. You can't just call him nice and be done. That's what Lewis is saying. Mad or bad? Well, we're going to see both of these responses in in Mark chapter 3 from those who are kind of on the inside of things. So first of all, Jesus' own human family. So these people have known Jesus since before day one of his life. Uh, Mary and Joseph had visits from angels about him at the time of his birth. You know the stories. You've probably been in the nativity plays. Surely his family will get it, right? His family will, will get that Jesus is special, right? We'll look at chapter 3, verse 21. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. That's how packed it was. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they, are, they were saying, he is out of his mind. Verse 31, Jesus' mother and brothers follow him to the house and try to take him home. So they see Jesus, they see the one they've grown up with since he was a a toddler, and they see him walking around and teaching people about the kingdom of God, and they they attempt, in effect, a a kind of intervention. They say he's he's out of his mind, he's gone nuts, they think he's mad. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's what you think when you read a gospel, when you hear people talk about Jesus. You think, good teacher maybe. I can't believe all this miracle stuff or the part about him being God. You'd have to be a total nutcase to go around claiming you're you're the son of God. Mad. Then there are the Jerusalem scribes. So so these guys' job, well, they're effectively administrators in Israel. They do a kind of public servants. They're judges, they're lawyers, they're secretaries. Their job is to interpret and to write out the Old Testament uh, law and to apply it to various areas of life. And so what are these guys who, who, they know inside out the promises of God in the Old Testament. They know that they're looking for a Messiah. They know what he's supposed to be like. Surely these guys will get it. Well, chapter 3, verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub. And by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. <coughs> They see Jesus' power and authority to heal people and to cast out demons, and they conclude that he must be working with Satan. Now, maybe you kind of get that. Maybe you read about Jesus and you think, no, I don't think he's mad. That doesn't add up. He's he's not the kind of guy that's mad. But I don't trust him either. There's something shady about Christianity, about Jesus. Maybe that's you. Maybe maybe to you it's, it's bad. Well, lastly, there are Jesus' own disciples. So his followers, those who who spend all day with him, they don't think Jesus is mad and they don't think he's bad. They trust him enough to leave their whole livelihoods, their fishing boats and everything else behind. 
Because there's something about this guy that I need to follow him. And maybe that's you too. Maybe you read the gospel for yourself and you agree, this clearly isn't a madman. It doesn't add up. And he's clearly not a possessed psycho. So what then? But the problem for the disciples is that they, they are hearing Jesus every day talk to the crowds and, and around their, around their mealtimes as a group, but they're not really listening yet. Spiritually speaking, it's like the lights are on, but there's nobody home. The disciples need to listen carefully. And that's the danger for, them, for my friends that I told you about earlier on. Are they listening carefully? to Jesus. Are we listening carefully? Well, as we face these, these questions about the different responses we're getting as we work through Mark, uh, we come to Mark chapter 4 and it's at this point that Jesus tells us four parables uh, to help us understand what's going on. And Jesus points to his family, to the scribes, to his disciples, to everyone listening, including me and you, is listen carefully. Listen carefully. And we're going to read the first and most famous of the parables together now. Uh, It's the parable commonly known as the sower. Although I think you can make a good case to actually call it something like the parable of the soils, as we'll see. Uh, But let's read it together. If you've got a Bible or an app, then if you've not been following already, then look up Mark 4. We're going to read from verse 1. This is Mark 4, verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the world, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. So, what's the difference? Why do some people go on and bear fruit for Jesus? And other people give up or not start in the first place. And why are some of the people on the very inside of the gospel, like Jesus' family or, or the scribes or people who've been brought up going to church their whole lives, like some of us, why do some of these people not get it? Well, Jesus tells us. First of all, it's not about the sower. Do you see that? All four plants in this parable have the same sower. Now, the sower in the parable represents a person sharing the gospel message with someone else. And in each case here, the same person shares the gospel with all four people. So it's not about the sower. And it's not about the seed either. Do you see that too? All four plants grow or don't grow from the same seed. 
The seed of the parable represents the gospel message itself. And the same message is shared with all four people. So that means it's not fundamentally about how skillfully or otherwise the gospel is, is shared with someone. Or what kind of evangelistic techniques or whatever are used. As long as the message is shared faithfully and accurately. So what then? It's about the soil, isn't it? It's about the ears and the hearts of where the seed is landing. So we're being called to listen carefully. First of all, Jesus talks about the seed that as the sower is casting it everywhere and anywhere, it lands on on the path. Now, in ancient farms, um, there would be this kind of thick, crusty piece of land around the edge of these strips of of farming where where the farmer and and animals are trampling it down every day. And 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 seed lands there, but it can't take root. There's there's no way it can break through the soil. So it just sits there and the birds come and, and pluck it up and fly off with it. And this represents... Um, people like Stan. They hear the word, they maybe go to Christianity Explore, they maybe go to church for years and hear hundreds of sermons, but every time they walk back out of the door, it's like they just instantly forget everything they've heard. Just, just like the words just bounced off them. Satan's goal is always to stop the gospel being properly heard. And if he can distract you right now, or put you off the second you hear the message of Jesus, then he will. Then there's the rocky soil. So some of the seed lands here where where there isn't really much of an opportunity for the seed to take root because the the ground there's just rocks. And this represents people like Alex. Maybe seed has been landing in Alex's life because she's grown up in a Christian home. Maybe it's been landing there all her life. But it's shallow. It never really takes root deep enough. It lies on the very surface. It's received with joy at first, Jesus says. At the moment there's hardship or persecution, maybe just the general feeling of being left out by the world. You give up. It's too hard. Third, then there's then there's a thorny soil. Some of the some of the seed lands here where there are kind of loads of weeds and thorns growing. And as the seed grows, the thorns choke it out. They battle with it for space, both under the ground where the roots are growing and also where they're battling for sunlight. And the thorns represent other things in our lives that might choke out the good news of the gospel. So for Jason, this is things like drinking and and listening more to unwise friends or to his non-Christian relationship. But it could be anything. Jesus says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. It could be anything. Finally, there is the good soil. The fertile soil. There the seeds can grow. They can produce grain and they can multiply. They can spread seed themselves and grow a crop many, many times. Greater than the original message that was shared. It's a miraculous harvest, Jesus is showing up. A hundredfold is greater than, than our even modern farming techniques could manage. It's a miraculous harvest where the seed lands on good soil. So if we're feeling discouraged by our evangelistic efforts and the responses we're getting, maybe we just feel like, I, I can't, I'm going to give up witnessing to Jesus. I'm not good at it. And people just aren't listening to the message. Well, then this is good news for us. Because in the other three parables that Jesus goes on to, to, show, his, to show his kingdom, he pictures it as a, as a seed that grows without the farmer knowing or doing anything. He just goes to bed and then the seed uh, grows. And another one is described as a tiny seed that grows into an enormous bush that, that birds of the air come to, come to nest in, representing people from all different parts of life, all different nationalities. In other words, the kingdom will grow and it's God's work. All he calls you to do is be faithful. While many people will not respond to the message, others will. Which means that our work is worthwhile. Let him do the work of of converting people and letting them come to faith and and get on with our job, which is sharing the gospel message of Christ. But back to us for now, because Jesus is asking each one of us at the same time in this parable, which soil are you? Which soil are you? When you hear the good news of Jesus, as you read the gospel for yourself, 
what you hear from a friend, however it is, how are you going to respond, even today? Not just when you first heard it and became a Christian, but every single time you hear the gospel preached and applied to some area of life, how are you going to respond? Jesus calls each of us to listen carefully. Listen carefully. Because look what he says in verse, in verse 10, verses 10 to 12. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And, and he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So they may indeed see but not perceive. And may indeed hear but not understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now you might think that's a very weird thing for Jesus to say. I mean, is he saying he doesn't want people to understand the gospel? Well, he's summarising Isaiah 6, where God tells the prophet Isaiah to speak judgment over Israel because they've not listened to him. And Isaiah is to tell the people of Israel, this is Isaiah 6, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And what God sent, sends Isaiah to do is to sort of put, put to the people a series of metaphors or kind of parables, if you like, physical pictures of, of God's message. And the point is that those who are really listening, who are really interested and want to listen to God, will, will work it out, will inquire and will find out the purpose of the metaphor. But those who don't want to listen carefully, those who are turning their backs on God, will not understand and they will be judged for it. God's intention is to separate the people based on whether they are listening or not. And Jesus' point to his disciples is that my parables have the same purpose. They work in the same way. If you want to understand and receive the amazing, powerful message of Jesus' kingdom, then it's here for you. But you must listen carefully. This is the answer to our question, is it? What makes the difference? Why are Jesus' family and the religious insiders not getting it? Why are his disciples so slow? Well, because it's only listening with faith that counts. Nothing else. Not about your background or your status or, or, how, or how many times you hear it. Hearing the word and having faith in it with care, building your life upon it. So let me spell out for you. Are you in danger tonight of being a path? Are you a stand? Are you just sitting here, enjoying the chili, singing the nice songs, but not really listening? Do you sometimes feel like the sermon in church has made sense, but, but then actually when you shut your Bible, it's all just forgotten about. You just kind of get on with your week and actually thinking about it. Yeah, I don't really, really get much out of church ever. Well, commit yourself right now to listen carefully to Jesus. Are you in danger of being rocky soil, perhaps? Are you an Alex? You've heard the word. You, you, you've loved it. But how deep are your roots? Are you taking this instruction and this warning seriously, building your life upon it? Will you take Jesus for what he says at face value? Will you trust him that when he says, that he will sustain you through whatever struggles and persecution you might face. Will you actually trust him with that? Don't just hear the word preached. Listen carefully. Or, or are you in danger of being thorny soil? Are you, in, are you adjacent? <coughs> are you kind of bumbling along, paying attention to Jesus one minute, but distracted by, by something else in your life the next? Anxious about other things, wishing for and hoping for things that you, that you don't have. Well, you must listen carefully to Jesus. Guys, if, if you need help, then there are people around you right now um, who, who are here to help you, to speak truth into your life and, and encourage you without picking up rocks to stay in you or judge you for it. Because we all need help. So, so speak to me or speak to a friend. If this parable has, has struck you and given you a, you know, a healthy kind of challenge tonight for where you are at the moment. I'm going to do something a bit different, a bit weird. I'd like everyone to get out your phone right now. 
Um, I want everyone to find it a notes app or something. Uh, if you're if you want to like me, just say some text. I do that because I you know I like it in text, but I don't really have many friends. So, um, <laughs> but but regardless, um, find something where you can write a note down. Whatever it is. But I want you to write down these two words in this note app. Listen carefully. And then I want you to write down one thing you're going to do to listen more carefully to Jesus. Anything you want, or anything you, you've been struck by tonight, or anything that you want to take away from here. And, and I'm asking you to do this because um, <laughs> I don't want anyone to feel awkward if they need to write something down to take away from tonight. Um, if everyone's doing it, no one has to feel awkward, and no one's looking at anyone else anyway. Um, I'll give you a minute to do that. Listen carefully, and then one thing you're going to do off the back of that. Maybe which, which kind of soil you feel challenged about potentially slipping into. Tell who are the art students and who are the science students there by who's writing an essay and who's doing it eloquently. I can't see what you're writing. <laughs> I give you I give you one moment more. Okay, well let's let's finish there. The kingdom of God is growing. The kingdom of God is growing because God is at work. He sends out sowers to spread the seed and it falls on many different types of soil, many different types of hearer, uh, many different kinds of listener. But here's the question for each of us this evening. What kind of hearer of the word are you going to be? Jesus' words have authority. Jesus' words have life. Jesus' words have the power to change everything about you if you listen. So will you listen carefully to Jesus? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I thank you so much for your word. Father, I, we, there'll be people here in all sorts of different um, positions, different situations, and different ways that you will have been challenging them and prompting them this evening as, as they've heard your word. And I, I pray, first of all, for those who, um, who just need to be encouraged, that as they continue to to speak truth to their friends as they continue to be bold in their classes or in their workplaces, whatever it is. Um, Father, please encourage them by your spirit that you are at work and that it is worthwhile to keep going because your kingdom is growing. And for those of us who who need a a little bit of a shake and a challenge tonight, Father, I pray that by your spirit you would do that as well. If there are um, different types of soil here this evening, Father, would you please challenge us to to not just be those who let the word bounce off us or, or those who um, don't let it go deep enough or those who let other things um, take away, fight out with that word in our lives. Father, would you please um, help all of us to trust you and to listen carefully as we go through the week, as we read your word for ourselves, as we come back to church and hear it preached again. Be with us all by your spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, uh, we're on a current and lose another couple of songs. So let's, uh, let's be on our feet again. <laughs>